Welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. And presenting with Kelly today is someone who knows the program from the ground up. Starting as a propulsion test engineer, he has earned his way into his present position as lead flight test engineer at Virgin Orbit. And perseverance pays. We have today an example of someone who understands that principle very well and having practiced it has achieved spectacular results. Always having to, wanted to have a career in space exploration, Kelly has stayed the course and demonstrated that success is what happens when opportunity meets preparation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kelly Latimer and Bryce Schaefer. All right, well, good morning, and thank you, everybody, for being here. So what we thought we'd talk about today is the Virgin Orbit experience of combining two worlds of flight, rocket meet airplane, airplane meet rocket, and trying to get airplane and rocket people to live in harmony in a successful operation. <laughs> Never an easy thing. So, um, so we're an air launch company. We basically launch a liquid fuel rocket off the wing of a 747. The goal is to put small satellites in space. Today, we've had three successful launches in a row. Our first successful launch was in January 2021. We put 10 satellites in space. Six months later in June, our second launch, we put seven satellites in space. And then following six months, just this last January, we put another seven satellites in space. So it's been an amazing, uh, successful story of our launches. But this is the story before the successful story. One of the biggest parts of our journey was, like I said, trying to get you know, airplane people, rocket people, two different worlds of flight to come and be one integrated successful program. So in the summer of 2019, it was a tale of two teams. Team plane and team rocket. At this point, the rocket team had finished all of their development, qualification, engine testing. Our first functional rocket was fully put together. Factory level testing was done. It was ready to ship up to the Mojave Air and Space Port. That's our current launch area. At the same time, the aircraft team had taken a modified aircraft, flown with a test rocket, proved our ability to take off with the rocket, fly with the rocket, land with it, and our final test was actually doing a drop test of our launch maneuver with a rocket, it was a dummy rocket filled with water and baffle balls. So at that point, these two teams very successful, but it was time to bring them together. And what's interesting is each of these teams really had their completely separate processes, procedures, the way they communicated, talked, the way they handled anomaly, system issues, and really it was two different cultures. So up to this point, we also had had no actual integrated um, rocket and aircraft operations, and the air launch is very complex. You know, we have our ground operations leading to a launch. There's over 100 people between the pad team, the control room, the air crew involved. It's multiple engineering disciplines. There are a lot of places for things to go wrong and little margin for error. The original program plan was we were gonna finish rocket testing, finish airplane testing, make the rocket, do some integration, and go for launch. But as we were sitting there in reality in the summer of 2019, looking at that, we realized, well, we never actually used a lot of this fueling equipment. We hadn't actually used the fully integrated rocket yet. And these two teams hadn't actually worked together in the control room and in the airplane yet. And beyond the pure technical factors was really a cultural difference. Um, you know, with the airplane people, we come from a, um, a high pedigree of background in flight tests where we, you know, we, we build on decades of experience in other test programs, hundreds of hours of you know, failures and successes previous to us. It's all human rated. We're used to going from experimental to operational. We vet the system, we know the system, we understand it. The crews are trained, they have procedures, they're all documented, and we build our way up. That is not at all what you find in a startup rocket company in the 2010s. Right? The culture of disruption that's taken place in the rocket industry is one that tests early, tests often, tests fast, they get the hardware going, and they're trying to get the launch as soon as possible. And you see these spectacular failures, you know, and sometimes it's actually expected that they're gonna launch, it's gonna fail, but that's okay. But that's easier to take when your people, the little pink bodies, are miles away from the hazard area. So the aircraft people that thought of these cavalier, devil-may-care rocket people endangering our beloved Cosmic Girl and even more beloved air crew was a non-starter. But at the same time, to this young, energetic rocket team who's used to you know, fast-paced, out-of-the-box thinking, using a very adaptable, changing style of operation, the thought of a 
stiff airplane people coming in and opposing processes, procedures, a slow buildup was just as unappetizing. So in the end, both of these teams needed to learn from each other, make compromises in order to come together. One other big hurdle was the union of airplanes and rockets really comes together in this new crew position that we had to create, and that's what Bryce did, is the, the position we call a launch engineer. The launch engineers on board the aircraft have complete command and control of that rocket from the time we step onto the airplane till we either launch it or have an abort and come back and land. It really is the pinnacle of combining these two worlds into one crew position. And in the summer of 2019, it really was in its infancy. We hadn't really used this position yet um, to its full weight. So what I'm going to do now is give you kind of a background of the program um, and the testing that was done. And then I'll turn it over to Bryce. And Bryce will talk through this campaign. You'll see it, we called it R2-D2. Star Wars fans, you're welcome. Um, it basically was this campaign that we had to create before we actually got to our first launch attempt. And it'll also talk about the creation of the launch engineer station. But our, our operation has three main parts. The first one, very important, is the rocket. So the rocket is a liquid-fueled rocket. It's two stages. The first stage we call a Newton 3. Second stage is Newton 4. And it has the payload um, capsule up front with the fairings. And that's where we carry satellites anywhere from, you know, one refrigerator-sized satellite or multiple small satellites. So it's a big variety of what we can carry up front there. The next is Cosmic Girl, my favorite. So Cosmic Girl is a passenger 747-400. We actually got it from our sister company, Virgin Atlantic, where she was in passenger service. And the cool story is that her name at Virgin Atlantic was actually already Cosmic Girl. So who knew that that was sort of a little letting her know what her post-passenger carrying life was going to be. And if you're ever flying around here and you see you hear Cosmic Girl 01, that's her official FAA call sign is Cosmic Girl 01. Um, anyways, it's a 747-400. Um, we initially took it to L3 to get it modified. So some of the modifications you can see, it's got this big, big red pylon there. Um, that is our company design and made pylon, but we had to do some structure mods to the wing in order to carry the weight of the pylon and the rocket. The total weight of those two right now is about 68, 70,000 pounds. We also had to run some, we had to run gas lines, electric lines, so we could take purge gases from the aircraft to support the rocket. We could run data between the aircraft and the rocket and also run electrical power. We also modified the bleed air system, so when we're up and away, we can use some of the aircraft bleed air system to have purging gases um, into the rocket to maintain environmental control. The last component, and probably the most complex, is the ground support equipment. As you can see here, there is a multitude of trailers, plumbing lines, generator units, air conditioning units, and all the trailers that hold the locks, the RP, um, and everything we need to fuel and defuel the rocket, and also the care and feeding when there's a payload and satellite up there does all the environmental control. But it is very complicated because there's a number of trailers there. The lines go to integration trailers. From the integration trailers, they get plugged into the aircraft. So it's a pretty complex operation. And up to this point, we hadn't really exercised all of this equipment. When they did the engine testing, there were specific tanks out there for the fueling. So we hadn't really, this is probably the, the least vetted system so far. So up to this point, um, you know, both the rocket and aircraft teams are doing what they're used to. They're in their silos. They're running tests. So right here, our engine test stands are up at Mojave. And this is a test stand of the Newton 3 thrust vectoring. So it's kind of cool because they were testing you know, maximum um, deflection of the thrust vector system. But the rocket team got busy in 2014 with the initial design. And then by 2015, we had our first successful long duration hot fires of both the first and second stage. And by 2019, all the qualification, all the development was done, uh, and the rocket was ready to go. Meanwhile, the aircraft went through its test program, but for the aircraft test program, all we used was basically a rocket with almost none of the components installed. It had the tanks, and it had a little bit of plumbing, it had a flight computer that had a little bit of smarts in it, but the idea was we'd be able to fill it with water so we could at least get the aerodynamic and the mass properties, because what we were interested in is how, how does the aircraft fly? Can I take off? Can I land? Can I do this maneuver? So the aircraft came out of modification from L3 in 2017. It took us about a little more than half a year to install all of our components on it. We also have gas pallets up in the front that have nitrogen and helium, and those gas pallets provide um, purging air and also pneumatics uh, power to the rocket. 
The biggest thing also is putting the launch engineer stations. So there's two launch engineer stations, and Bryce will go through this in more detail later, but there's two launch engineer stations on the upper deck. Then you have all the computers and all the equipment and all the cooling and stuff that goes with that. So all that got installed. We flew the aircraft, and then 2019, um, we did our drop test, which is the top right picture there, and that was a NASA chase aircraft. Those guys did a great job of getting photos and video for us. But the other thing to note is our release isn't normal. It's not like a straight level, just drop the rocket. We try and give the rocket as much of an advantage as possible, so we really pull the nose up. So we start at about 30,000 feet, 0.85 Mach. We give about a 2G pull, and we get that aircraft. And the 747 at 33 degrees is really impressive. So like some of the video you see, you're just like, no way. So we pull us to 33 degrees, and then we wait for an altitude airspeed combination. When we hit that, we drop the rocket, and then at that point, you know, the aircraft is sort of out of airspeed and ideas. We're not going to fly anymore because we're pretty slow, but it has a natural roll off. So the rocket drops, it goes on its way, and then we do this like gentle falling leaf, you know, kind of nose high recovery, about 0 0.2, 0 0.5 Gs, let the nose get down, get airspeed, and then pull back out. And I'll have to say, when we do training runs and people are in the back, it's a crowd pleaser because especially you get that big pull up, and then sometimes we'll try and push over a little more. We have like a little stuffed rocket. We'll have, kind of have him floating in the air and stuff as we're doing recovery. So we have great fun training for this. Um, but meanwhile, like I said, the, the, this entire um, plethora of ground support equipment and technicians at this point was the least vetted of all of it, and it's also the most hazardous part because. Here, there's about a dozen or so fueling lines and other lines connected to the rocket. When we do the fueling operation, everyone's away. As soon as the rocket's fueled, these technicians walk right up to the rocket and manually disconnect the different hoses, and sometimes you have to, have to replace some panels and stuff. So there's an entire hazardous op that happens when the rocket is full of tens of thousands of pounds of liquid oxygen. These guys are coming up and they disconnect those lines before we move the aircraft out. And then same thing, if we land with the rocket, they come back up, hook those lines up, and then once they're hooked up, everybody steps back and the fueling and defueling happens. So to kind of give you an idea of the complexity, so as, as we're in 2019 and we're looking at this, we're like, all we know is we have about 15 minutes for this operation to happen. By the time the fueling's done, we got 15 minutes to get the guys in there, get disconnected, get the airplane towed. And it was going to be very confusing, a lot of people on the ramp. And so we really had to step back and create these step-by-step -step procedures and designate who's in charge. So there's four major groups involved in this. One is the Mission Control Center. That's the engineers at the controls, um, at, the, at the consoles, monitoring all the data. And they are there all the way through the fueling of the entire operation. The lead there is the launch conductor. That's the person who's actually directing the actions, the steps, the procedures, who's doing what. Then we have the air crew. Two pilots, two launch engineers, pilot and command is in charge there. Then we have our flight ops team, and these are all the maintenance technicians that do the ground support equipment for just the aircraft, the air conditioning, the power units, moving the stairs in, moving them out. They go into the cargo compartment, fire up the nitrogen and helium pallets, um, connect and disconnect the data line. Their leader is DFO. And then we have Wolfpack, for all of you hangover fans, Wolfpack. Anyways, there's the Wolfpack, and those are the pad technicians and engineers, and those are the ones that actually do the running the trailers, the fueling, the lines, the disconnect, the connects, the generator, so all the servicing out there on the ramp. Their lead is Wolfpack lead. Clever. So anyways, um, as we kind of lay this out, so on the left side there is kind of who's in control of the ramp. So who's in control of the persons, the people, the equipment, and everything on the ramp. The right side is who's in control of the rocket. And it was sort of two different things, and we had to divide it up that way. So when we first finished fueling, the mission control has control of the rocket, the ramp, everything. So everyone is stepped back. No one gets to come in. There's cameras that monitor the ramp. So they're in control. And then once um, the fueling is done and there's a little time for safety, they then clear the Wolfpack team. So then this whole team goes up, takes a look at the rocket. So at that point, Wolfpack is in charge of the ramp and the people, but control room has the rocket. Once everything is good, the air crew gets on the airplane. Uh, we fire up the APU. Maintenance disconnects the equipment from the aircraft. The launch engineers get their station up and going. And once they have good data, we disconnect a data line at that point. Rocket control is with the launch engineers, ramp is with Wolfpack. Then there's a point where the lines are disconnected, we're ready to tow out. At that point, the Wolfpack steps back, gives control to the flight ops team, and now they're in charge. We tow the aircraft out, start engines, and then off we go. And then if we actually get to a successful launch, we come back, park in a normal spot, we have champagne, woo, it's all good. If for some reason we abort and come back, it kind of uh, repeats itself, but opposite order. So basically the aircraft tows in, 
DFO has control of ramp and everything. Launch engineers have control of the rocket. We push it back. Once the aircraft is good, Wolfpack comes out. They have control of the ramp. When the data line gets connected, good data. Launch engineers give control back to MCC. The air crew walks away. Once the lines are all connected, Wolfpack walks away, and the control room has it all again. So very complicated. And, and, just, and, and it took us a while to step through this, because at first we're like, OK, we go out there, and, there's, and within this, there's people running multiple sub-procedures of procedures and getting it checked off. And so this whole array of connection, disconnection was actually extremely difficult. So we thought, well, there's no way we're ready to just go straight for it. Put it on the airplane, and let's go for launch. And so we basically created this R2-D2. We called it Rocket 2 Drills and Demonstrations. And what it was was a campaign in the middle to allow us to create, understand, and train these procedures to the point where we were good to go with liquid oxygen operations and go for launch. And so within this, we had to create a few objectives. And so the point of it all really was, one, to make sure that we trained the crews, because this is the first time any of us did this and had to all do it together. So everybody, primaries, backups was trained. The next one was that we had actually hashed out all of the procedures, practiced them, including non-normal procedures. We had an entire emergency response plan in case there was a very bad day. We want to make sure that we had vetted that and practiced that and people knew who to call and what to do and who was following which procedures. And then another big one was the fact that we actually did this entire, this is the first time we really fueled the entire integrated rocket so that we did that, collected all the data, and assured ourselves that the systems were actually good to go. So in build-up fashion, because of this, we built an entire new test stand out at Mojave. So what this test stand was was nothing more than someplace for us to hang the rocket. We had the same hooks as if it was on the pylon with the aircraft. So we basically hung the rocket out there, and it allowed us to start going through this entire trailer operation, hoses, fueling, defueling, but miles away from anybody else, and mostly miles away from our beloved Cosmic Girl. And so from here, Bryce is going to take it over and start talking about um, the actual opera operations at R2-D2 and then the launch engineer station. Okay. Check, check. All right. Uh, so thanks, Kelly, for the introduction. I'm going to take us home now. Um, let's see. We got our clicker working here. Cool. Uh, so at each stage of the campaign, operations would progress from dry runs first to uh, LN2, or liquid nitrogen operations, and then finally to liquid oxygen operations. As you can see, kind of broken down on this chart, there's also the obvious split up between the Necrostan 5 operations and the Cosmic Girl operations. And splitting it up this way allowed us to uh, retire risk pretty early throughout the campaign and make sure that we were doing a slow build-up approach from uh, the operations that we had done to date with our orbital rocket and our, our equipment that we care so much about. So when all the objectives were met at Neckerstan 5, the rocket was shipped to the hammerhead uh, and made it to the aircraft. And with the added complexity of the aircraft, the ground uh, equipment, and aircraft movement, we stepped back into dry runs, which culminated into a taxi test uh, with an empty rocket. Then LN2 operations were performed with a taxi test and a flight test. Uh, and then after that, the final stage was to switch liquid nitrogen out for liquid oxygen. Uh, and those tests consisted of a cryogenic tanking test to get all of our procedures into place, and then a full up wet dress rehearsal start to finish to make sure that everything flowed kind of exactly as we had expected it to. And so to step it back a little bit uh, before we get into that, as Kelly mentioned, this campaign was not something that we had originally put into the plan. Uh, so R2-D2 was something that we really had to think critically about. And so we sat down and, and listed out all of the, the benefits of doing this type of operation so that we could make sure that we were making it worth the investment. Uh, so the initial estimate was about six to eight months of time. Uh, which is obviously not a small schedule impact for any company to undertake, and especially one uh, that's a startup launch company with you know limited budget at hand. We also had uh, myself, the onboard launch engineers coming into the picture, who didn't have you know the thousands of years of experience as the other crew members had on our team, uh, and so ultimately it was the the human safety factors that came. 
uh, and convinced us that were really the reason that we needed to implement something like R2D2. Uh, so, you know, the crewed air launch really requires a paradigm shift from the uncrewed ground type launch that uh, so many companies are used to and so many people in our organization were used to uh, undergoing. Um, and those operations had a, a much bigger safety impact and, uh, you know, this was not something that a lot of startup companies would take, uh, you know, take on willingly. So, Nekrastan 5 would interface with the orbital rocket 2 in all of the critical ways, uh, from the mechanical hooks that held the rocket, the fluid connections that would feed pressure to the propellant tanks, and the electrical connections that would carry data and send all the data back to the engineers in the control room and all the way to the launch trailers being arranged in the exact same way as they would when they were sitting next to Cosmic Girl on the runway ramp. The primary objective of this early testing was to get through a full-on mission simulation, including the rocket being filled with propellants, then disconnected from the trailers by the ground crew, commanded into the terminal count, uh, countdown auto sequence by the flight crew, and then stepping back through that reverse order that Kelly showed on her slide. Uh, reconnecting all the propellant lines, offloading, uh, and uh, getting back into the safe state. So it took a total of four months, or what we had shown as one day in the original schedule, to complete this initial phase of testing at NS5. Uh, and it, this testing proved every bit as difficult as we could expect. Uh, the rocket leaked every commodity available, and probably some that weren't even available. Where'd that come from? Um, so really, you know, it was, it proved to be so imperative for us to start off with the relatively benign liquid nitrogen rather than the more reactive liquid oxygen. Um, and that allowed us to go and, and find these leaks and vet out the system and make sure that it had the, the integrity that it needed to, to withstand captive carry flight. Uh, communication pathways, both human to human and computer to computer, um, failed at some point along the way. There were procedural missteps, uh, procedures that, you know, had typos and errors in them, and as much as I hate to admit, procedures that hadn't even been written yet. So we also found that all of these procedures needed to have the necessary backout steps in order to, to go from a hazardous point in the procedure back to uh, decreasing the hazard level. And so we had to come up with all these uh, failure scenarios that I'll talk about a little bit later. So when NS5 operations were complete, the test team had really proven out the integrity of this Rocket 2 uh, and firmed up the procedures enough to make the big move to Cosmic Girl, who was waiting for us on the hammerhead of Runway 30 at the Mojave Air and Spaceport. At this time, uh, in R2-D2, the integration of the airplane people and the rocket people that Kelly talked about had not entirely occurred. We were getting there, but we still had a long ways to go. While many of the early operations that we were doing at the Hammerhead could be cut from the same NS5 playbook, there were nuances lurking around every corner. Uh, with so many things coming together for the first time, the team needed a big win uh, that was wrapped in a, single te a simple test. They needed to see that the basics of connecting, disconnecting, and moving all of this equipment could work together. And they also needed to communicate and work together to achieve and meet an operational timeline that we had put forth in front of ourselves. So what followed was really the world's most boring taxi test, but it was essential to demonstrating that uh, we had the key operational elements in place uh, to complete what would soon be the world's most complex launch operation. So the team methodically disconnected all the necessary interfaces to allow Cosmic Girl to taxi down the runway with an orbital class rocket under her left wing. And when this taxi test was complete, the team simply reconnected everything and put the system to sleep. And while it sounds very simple, this uh, you know, re relatively easy test took the entire day because uh, you know, the operational and communicational skills required had not really been universally developed across the team. Many people had not yet seen just the sheer amount uh, it takes to move a massive 747 down the runway, and even fewer to this point understood how choreographed those movements of equipment and people would need to be to meet the, the operational deadline that we put in front of ourselves. 
Over the first half of 2020, we completed eight major operations under, uh, with, with Rocket 2 under the wing of Cosmic Curl. Uh, with each event was an opportunity to perfect the procedures that we had written, uh, building up to a full-on launch operation. Uh, so much like the hardware connections between rocket, plane, and ground, system, uh, ground systems, there was a concert of procedures being executed simultaneously in the aircraft, in the mission control room, and on the flight line uh, spread across several different communications nets. LN2 operations were capstoned with an LN2 captive carry flight on April 12th of 2020 by a team uh, that had just recently been distanced due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So right when we had thought that we had figured out how to get everyone you know, in one place and, and working closely together in a single control room, we now had to have six control rooms in order to get people separated enough to, uh, to make sure we were accounting for the safe and, uh, safety and health of our, our team. So now more than ever, the channels of communication uh, and situational awareness were absolutely critical to the success of this mission. So this flight was as, full, as close to a full-up uh, mission as we could make it, including uh, an abort out at the last minute in, inside of terminal count and returning to base with the rocket uh, safely for defueling operations. So finally, after we had completed this pretty complex flight, the switch from liquid nitrogen to liquid oxygen at this point uh, was pretty much a formality. So we had proven out the truly novel aspects of air launch by this time, and it was really uh, pretty nice to come back and, and make this switch to liquid oxygen and find that everything that we had written to date pretty much worked the way that we needed it to. Um, there were certainly a couple aspects that we had to adapt, but when so much emphasis had been placed on flight-like execution up front, uh, at the beginning of RTD2, operating with the real propellants uh, on the wing of Cosmic Girl was pretty much routine to this point. So the largest technical and operational challenges had been overcome, and where previously we had airplane and rocket teams which stood apart, uh, we now had a single cohesive launch team uh, with enough collective experience to launch Rocket 2 to space. Uh, so at this point, it was time to hand the show over to a small team who, like I mentioned, up to this point in time had been slowly working their way into the operation, uh, and that's the launch engineers. That's me. That's where I come into it. Um, so. Once uh, fueling operations are complete, Cosmic Girl takes the role of an airborne launch pad and control center flown by the two pilots and uh, the rocket in command of uh, two launch engineers in the back. Uh, the ground-based mission control center becomes a support team who is needed to assist the crew in carrying out this initial phase of the mission to get us out to the drop point. And the Cosmic Girl crew is authorized to autonom autonomously conduct the mission according to a set of predetermined mission rules. So, of course, it's, it's important to emphasize that we had this entire mission control room on the ground ready to assist us at the drop of a hat, but you can't always necessarily rely on that communication pathway, and so if we get out there flying around and we lose that communication pathway, the crew has to be able to either proceed towards launch or uh, do what they need to come back and land on the ground for defueling. Uh, so that really defined the role of the launch engineer and the responsibility that we had, which was to provide a minimal crew with all of the tools and information necessary to execute very precise count-on operations of a liquid-fueled rocket, including these return-to-base contingencies. So techniques were adopted from heritage aviation, ground-based rocket launch, and human-rated spaceflight operations. And between those three, we could really combine uh, decades of time-tested methods to uh, apply them to our virgin orbit launch operations. The two-person LE concept is really just a matter of safety, taken directly from the two-pilot concept that's used, used in aviation. Uh, as I'm sure you're all familiar, the presence of two engineers allows you to cross-check data displays and checklists to make sure that nobody's making any mistakes. Um, and this is especially important for uh, parts of the mission that require manual input. Uh, there are minimal hard panel switches at our stations. You can see that we're kind of sitting there um, behind some pretty large monitors. 
similar to pilot operations, in-flight duties can be more efficiently spread across uh, two engineers, especially in the event of an anomaly or emergency scenario. And as I said before, we've got the entire mission control room on the ground who is there to assist us at any time, but having two people on board that kind of speak the same language allowed us to, to you know, uh, make sure that we're, we're checking each other and, and doing everything safely. Uh, so the control room does not have remote control of the rocket or the plane systems, as that authority re resides only with the flight crew. So similar to the adaptation of the two pilot concept, the ELEs pulled from uh, aviation and other heritage industry conventions when developing the role. A simple example of this is uh, our system alerts and warnings and the mitigations that uh, get displayed along with those. So we took a concept that had been carried over from a 24-person control room and transformed it into something that two people could handle um, mentally, really. You know, if, you're, if you see something that trips a warning on the screen, you have to be able to respond to it um, and react. And while we obviously have a little bit more real estate on our screens than the pilots do up front, uh, we kind of took the same approach uh, to make sure that these warnings and alerts had very obvious, uh, actionable, uh, logical steps that we could take if we saw one of these warnings trip. So doing this, we had to basically cut down uh, the number of of warnings that was originally slated for the larger control room by about 50% um, to make sure that it was something that we could study and, and memorize and learn um, and take action upon if, if something happened. So, uh, you know, the, the thing that we kind of strive for was think about when you get in your car and driving down the road, you're not necessarily looking at your tachometer all the time, but uh, if your check engine light pops up, you can kind of just go to your operator manual and read the instructions for what to do. Um, if something happens. So when we were done with this uh, kind of vetting of all of those warnings, we had a pretty, pretty logical system that we could actually handle. Uh, so what we had to do then was basically write that operator's manual. Uh, so we had to come up with a set of predetermined anomaly response procedures. And throughout R2D2 and the mission, uh, or the, the operation up until this point in time, a lot of the operators were responding to anomalies with uh, their own learned responses, or they were storing data in several different repositories or directories in the company. Um, and that's obviously not possible for uh, two people who have to make you know, potentially fairly quick decisions while operating um, in an airborne environment. For the pilots of the carrier aircraft, the Boeing 747 Quick Reference Handbook does this uh, and it, it basically outlines all of the non-normal aircraft situations and the responses to take when that happens. Uh, other other well-known programs, such as Apollo, had extensive documentation of their flight rules catalog for operators in their control rooms to use and respond to. So we, we drew inspiration from both of these documents. Um, we, you know, we could access the publicly available flight rules from the Apollo era. Um, we could take a look at the Quick Reference Handbook to, um, to sort of you know, copy some of the formatting and use some of the tried and true uh, visualization techniques that had already been proven. So <coughs> procedures in the launch reference handbook uh, contain the words proceed and scrub, and they're, they're bolded and color coded to facilitate quick identification of our predicted mission status each time we get into one of these procedures. And that allows the LEs to quickly communicate with the pilots in case we're making any flight path changes uh, and safety critical anomalies which might require <coughs> an emergency release or our code word for jettison of the vehicle uh, from the wing utilize a similar strategy by highlighting the, light, the letters ER in bold red text next to the title of the procedure. So because we had went through all the thought process and formation of this document uh, and it was all agreed upon non-normal procedures. It's really used as both an operational document and a training tool. And so combined with the forethought to make it, the LRH has become the most important repository for critical information and non-normal procedures used for launch operations at Virgin Orbit. 
So one of the biggest challenges that we faced as a new crew coming into this uh, complex operation was, how do we get started uh, in this system that's very complex without feeling like we're getting in the way? You know, we obviously have to get experience, but we're dealing with multi-million dollar assets, uh, which are completely unique technology that we really can't replicate uh, very quickly. We need to make sure that um, we're kind of taking our time getting started and, and getting used to how these operations work. So this is where that uh, build-up approach that we talked about helped us immensely. Uh, we had about a year and three months to focus on our training uh, for our first launch operation. Thanks, uh, you know, I say thanks to the length of the, the R2D2 campaign um, and the sheer number of tests that it included. So we obviously got a lot of training through just the normal rocket operations and development. But in addition to this, we combined a lot of academics training. You know, that's uh, reading through those mitigations and creating the document that I had talked about, the reference handbook. Uh, we did countless ferry flights of the aircraft without the rocket attached uh, in order for us to get, you know, just used to sitting in those seats and making sure we're not puking when Kelly's doing that launch re release maneuver. Um, so we did countless flights and, you know, it was as, it could be a simple flight to the maintenance hangar uh, somewhere that's, you know, not even remotely close to where we normally operate out of, but we would use those opportunities to just gain really useful experience on board. Uh, and then we had a bit of a scrappy simulator tool. Uh, we actually used the 747 simulator up at the Ames Research Center in Mountain View, California which for the pilots is a perfect way for them to train because it's a full-on motion simulator, but it has none of the, the capability of our launch system built into it. So the launch engineers kind of came up with this scrappy method for doing some simulation training up there with them, which really forced us to get into that operational mindset without the, I guess, weight of a, uh, the system you know, operating behind us. So that was kind of an easy way for us to get some really quick and dirty experience even though it, it wasn't the perfect simulator. So that's kind of how we uh, made sure that we came up to speed slowly and, and again, you know, combined with the time that it took for us to get uh, ready for our first launch operations, by the time we had completed all of this, the launch engineers truly were the experts in the systems we were operating. So let's talk about how it went a little bit. Uh, with R2-D2 complete and the LE stations and procedures ready to go, the first launch attempt occurred on May 25th of 2020. The launch operation really did proceed seamlessly through propellant load all the way up to this picture perfect release of the rocket that you can see here. Uh, you know, seeing photos of, of what it's like to watch this thing drop and then ignite and then try to go to space um, is really incredible. Unfortunately, on this first attempt, the rocket suffered an anomaly of like just a few seconds into the first stage burn. Uh, but from the launch operation side of things, uh, it was a smashing success. So prior to our next launch, uh, which occurred uh, about nine months later, the rocket underwent a few minor modifications, but uh, everything with the human portion of the operation had now been verified and solidified. So the success and utility of R2-D2 was well recognized and the, uh, the Neckerstand 5 test stand and the framework of R2-D2 became the baseline of our preparation for all subsequent launches. With each launch, as we progressed, we gained confidence and maturity in our systems, procedures, and training, uh, and the scope of R2-D2 was incrementally decreased. Uh, recently, we've been talking about reviving the same type of sequence for testing locally before shipping a rocket to uh, an international launch uh, location which we're planning to do this summer in the UK spaceport Cornwall. Uh, so it's really, you know, kind of taking a step back and, and seeing the program understand that the utility of this campaign was really uh, crucial to our, our, you know, short growth to an operational company. It's really nice to then come back and see some of these same techniques applied to uh, new campaigns that have different challenges associated with them. So. Uh, we're going to show a video of our first successful launch in January 2021.
LCS is LDM Control. We are currently on track uh, for our nominal timeline, and our current uh, drop time as listed in Trillion is 1925 UTC. Plane of control on flight crew has been boarded the aircraft. Cosmic Girl, this is Orbit Base. You are go for takeoff. Copy, go for takeoff. Altitude 3000. And Orbit Base, Cosmic Girl is starting to turn to the inbound. Pulling now. Pull. Pulling. Release. Release, release, release. Really? This is ignited. Confirm Newton 3 engine startup. Max Alpha GD. TBC is in first stage looking good. We had a pretty awesome view up here. Max Q Alpha achieved. Stage 1 burn nominal. Stage set, break wire is broken. Newton force startup complete. We've recovered and we are now returning to base. Bearing, break wire is broken. Launcher one's in space. Sounds like a blue guy wants to fly. This is ready to head on control. Mauritius has confirmed acquisition. Payload separation confirmed. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> yeah, we have a Guardians of the Galaxy theme. <laughs> but now we're open for any questions. Yeah? Questions. So the question was, is this cost competitive with other um, launch organizations or launch operations? And yes, it is. And in particular, we're going after just the small satellites uh, market because right now they're not really serviced very well. Um, you have to typically uh, ride along with a larger uh, satellite or a larger launch. And so our goal is one, make it affordable, but also responsive, where if you have a small satellite, we could launch you in three months instead of three years. And also the ability to launch worldwide is very appealing um, as nations would like to launch out of their own soil, their own runways and stuff. So it is, it's on its way to being cost competitive, but the first ones are always more expensive than the later ones. Yeah, I don't really know what the, uh, I always defer these questions to business because I don't really know the finances. Um, but it, it is, I mean, the initial development is expensive and there's a business model that as we're able to launch, I mean, so far these first launches are six months apart. The goal is you get to 10 launches a year, 18 launches a year, you're launching, you know, we're gonna have another launch vehicle and as you're launching more, then you start recouping that cost and you do it where it's still affordable for the satellite launcher, but we begin to recoup that cost over the years. Yeah, I'd say probably the biggest difference is they, they launch from straight and level. And so I think what's really unique for us is that launch maneuver. And we, we spent a long time working that, mostly in the simulator. Um, because initially we were at a higher altitude, but at higher altitudes you couldn't get quite as much pull. And, it was, and you're a lot closer to stick shaker and stall. And, and for the pilots to do it repetitively was difficult because each of us had a little you know, different technique on how we'd pull and how much we use trim. And then, so we would iterate with the rocket team on their desired release conditions, and it came down and we actually went lower to give them more gamma, but then we stole a little bit of the Virgin Galactic playbook where we pretty much do that gamma turn with trim. So what we have is the pilot not flying basically runs the trim a certain delta from where the, the trim setting is, and that gives us this consistent pull every time. So between pilots, as there's four or five or six, you know, later eight different pilots doing this maneuver, the initial pull is the key to getting on parameters. So by running that trim, that helps get that first G. And then at the end, it's just a little correction to get there. But we spent a lot of time in the sim, a lot of data, like hundreds of runs between multiple pilots to, to hash it out. But I think that's the biggest difference in ours is that release maneuver. And something that's definitely unique about our system too is that uh, unlike, you know, 
the X-15 or even spaceship, when you release those vehicles, you're expecting them to kind of take off and then they eventually come back. Uh, our rocket is, I think, the only, well, I guess there's a couple other examples, but you know, once we drop it, that thing has to light up and go into space, and if it fails, then you know, it, it falls into the ocean. Uh, so there's really a lot of differences that come in between us and other launch companies where we had to kind of tune that sequence and really it, it came down to just removing any sort of aborts out of the engine startup sequence. You know, once you release that rocket, you're not getting it again, so you might as well try to send it up to space. Yeah, so the question was, if we have to emergency release the rocket, does it have a destruct mechanism? And the answer is no, it just falls into the ocean. Yeah, so the question was, how do we, we bring these teams together that were so different and everything? And I think really, like the, you know, we talked about, we started with dry runs. And, and the beauty of the dry run was we didn't have a timetable or a schedule. But some of these things, we literally sat down tabletop. We'd have like the launch conductor, the pilots, you know, DFO, and Wolfpack. And we're like, OK, let's say we're on the ramp when this happens. Like, for who's in charge? How do we handle it? So some of it just started with table topping, you know, what happened. And then you step into the dry, um, the dry hookups. And you do a brief ahead of time, and you say, there's no time frame. If somebody sees something, bring it up, we stop. And that was a lot of it, was being able to just go very slow and have someone say, hold on, I didn't, let's, let's back this up, you know, two steps, because that wasn't right. And then it took a long time, but I think it was those exercises that. So each team got to work together so that they knew each other and what they were doing. Yeah, and, and there's multiple comments. It gets very confusing, because like, like the DFO would be on channel A and B, and then meanwhile the pad team is on channels D, C, and E with, with the LC, and then the LEs are you know, just on the radio. So it's, it was working out like who actually can't hear who, who talks to who, like when, like when do we say this step is done, and how do we on the aircraft know that? It, was, it took a long, long time to get through all that. Yeah, and it's, it's not perfect either. Uh, I remember specifically this one test, I think it was maybe the taxi test, something we were getting ready to you know put this thing into use for the first time with propellants loaded and we were talking through the details in the pre-flight or the the pre-task briefing to make sure we were gonna uh, go do everything safely and one one part of the program had gotten really focused on this one specific thing and they came out of this conversation in this day before like task briefing and they were like well if, if things go wrong, the, the, we're not sure if you know, the rocket can withstand these forces. And we were like, really? <laughs> we we right. missed something Where, here. Where'd that come from? Yeah, like it's just going <laughs> to fall off and fall on the ground. I guess, how are we ever going to fly with this thing? So it, it was a lot of uh, just making sure that the teams were interfacing at the right times and, and kind of evolving that over time to make sure that it, it works in the end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the question was the work atmosphere at Virgin Orbit and stuff. And I would say having come from, you know, I was military, you know, government, NASA, Boeing and stuff. And coming to Virgin, it's, it's as fun as it seems like. You know, the atmosphere is very open, very sharing. Um, you know, it's kind of like open desks, everything. People walk by. We would have, you know, like once a month, there'd be like a get together on Friday just there in the building here at Conan. They would have, you know, drinks out, sometimes live music. We had like Hawaiian dancers come in one time. And then we'd have these, you know, and then like once every quarter or so, we'd have these bigger events and maybe Sir Richard Branson would come in for, you know, which was a huge deal. But there really was this work together, like work hard, but have fun, get to know each other kind of atmosphere. So that definitely feeds. And the rockets are built in Long Beach. Yeah, the rockets are built right here, yep, in Long Beach. So the question was, how, how are we going to continue modeling and sim simulation in the future to improve these processes? And you could probably talk best about that as far as like mission sim. Sure, yeah. So our operation right now, uh, we, we believe that we fully understand how it operates and how it uh, responds to the environments that we're putting it into. So it's really key to make sure that as we go on, we're not going to introduce a new uh, forcing function or anything that can change sort of that baseline assumption uh, with simulation that we've done in the past to make sure that we're safe to fly. So it's really when we go to do something new uh, and take like the flight out of Cornwall, for example, that that's going to be a new location. But uh, we kind of make sure that we we do the same type of build up approach to that. Uh, and we've we've stepped back for a second to make sure that anything that's new can't affect 
the way that we've done things in the past. So it's really, you know, stepping into the early stages of those campaigns to make sure that you've kind of thought of everything and that's where the culture sort of thing comes into play. Everybody has a chance to, to bring something up, you know, it's not any sort of atmosphere uh, with any animosity behind it. Uh, and then we kind of identify those things and then go analyze them as needed or, you know, do the math that is required to convince ourselves that it's not a problem. Ah, so this was asking about if the rocket at the end is on its own, how do we get the photos back? So basically it just, so the rocket's always telemetering data, and so the camera's on board, so it just telemeters the, the video along with it. So we have video on the aircraft, there's cameras pre-positioned um, on the, like in the windows and underneath, so some of the photos come from that. There's one on the pylon that usually shows it drop. We have a chase aircraft, and then the rocket itself has some cameras on it, and that's how we get that live stream up in space, uh, yeah. Let's go over here. I know he's been trying. <laughs> yeah, so the question was, when we go to do remote operations, uh, how do we get the payloads over to those areas? So that's one that we're working on right now. Um, it's basically to make sure. Yeah, yeah, we UPS them. Uh, no, we, we, we need to you know do what we can to make sure that we have the right facilities in that area to do the payload processing. So right now, our payload processing happens in Long Beach, but as things change, uh, we need to make sure that we're giving the customer all their requirements from the moment that the payload leaves the facility uh, out to where we're integrating it on, on wing. So typically, that's probably going to mean that we'll process payloads on site at whatever location we're at. Uh, and if that changes, then we're going to kind of have to come up with some, some ways to make sure that the moment that the payload leaves the payload processing center, wherever that may be, we're taking care of it along the way. And so that, that might, we might come up with some uh, interesting ways, you know, if we have to ship it on the aircraft, which we will do with all of our rockets, you know, they have to get to the, the launch site in just the same way that the payloads do. Uh, we're, we'll make sure that we take care of everything along the way and also include all of the monitoring equipment to meet those requirements that the customers have. Have put forth. And then even the, the ground equipment also is, there, there's a second version of it that's basically set up to be put on a 7-4 freighter basically with the rocket and shipped. So there's a second version that's have the certification to get shipped overseas. And that's the way basically you pack sort of, at least for the equipment rocket side, you pack it all up into a freighter, you know, take it there, deliver it, and you're good to go, and then payload. Yeah, goes. and there's even an interesting, uh, you know, another thing that we had to solve was once we've mounted the payload on the wing, if we're not going to fly how do we make sure that it's safe from all, you know, the, those blasting Mojave winds? So we actually have a mobile payload uh, trailer. It's, you know, basically the size of an RV that can then encompass the payload at the launch site, uh, which I think is kind of a unique uh, solution to a problem. Yeah. Let's go in the back. Yeah, it really comes down to our launch license and something being designated as a spaceport. So right now, even though we're air launch, we're considered that we launch out of Mojave, so right now our license is you need to take off and land at a spaceport. So even after we drop the rocket, we can't come back and land at Long Beach. We have to go basically full stop at Mojave, say, mission complete, we're now under our experimental ticket, and then we can take off and come to Long Beach. So part of that is regulatory, part of it is also unpopulated areas, because as we do this, since they basically do you know, the expected casualty analysis like you do for any launch, ours starts from taking off at Mojave and rooting, you know, so we have a special route we go. So it'd be tough to do that out of here. What are you so we operate under a launch license under AST when we're doing a launch, and then we're under the FISDO, our experimental ticket, when we don't have the rocket. Or actually, I'm sorry, it's really the intent to launch. So we can, that's like captive carry and stuff, and even LN2 is under experimental, but anytime we're going to, we intend to launch, then we come under the launch license. Sure, so the question was, um, with Women's History Month, can I give a little uh, history of me? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, so for me it started, you know, as long as I can remember, I wanted to be an astronaut, right? Like, I remember being in, you know, preschool, watching, like, Romper Room, and there was, like, this little kid dressed as an astronaut, and I was like, you can't wear that, that's what I want to be. I mean, I just remember, like, wanting to do it way back when. So, it started with that dream of being an astronaut and stuff, and 
I basically rode my bike to the library in eighth grade and looked up astronaut in the encyclopedia, and I was like, oh, I'm a military test pilot. They're all military test pilots. What is that? And I was sort of backed it up to, you know, like playing this career where, well, what I have to do is I got to go to the military, be a pilot, get high performance time, whatever that means, and then be a test pilot, and then I'll be an astronaut. So I sort of charted this career from like way back when I was really young, and then just, you know, kind of followed it through, and then, um, you know, I actually did an interview at uh, Johnson Space Center, but I didn't pass the medical for this little minor issue that seems silly to me, but it's their, their rules. Um, and so when I retired, I sort of had this great career test flying that, to be honest, if I hadn't been like chasing this astronaut dream, I would have never known to do that, you know, because I was, you know, looking at the whole space thing. So when I retired, there was a job at um, NASA, so I, I went to them for about a year, and then Boeing had a job come open, so I jumped ship and went to Boeing. And then after about eight years there, I got a call from a friend of mine at Virgin Galactic was like, hey, I don't know if you've heard of Virgin Galactic or if you've thought about the space thing at all, but we're going to hire a couple pilots. And, you know, if you're interested, you should apply. And so I applied. The dream still lives. So I came along Virgin Galactic. And then with that, I, I stuck with orbit through the first few launches. Then I'm, you know, back to Galactic now, hopefully getting to fly soon. So the Air Force, um, I flew, I started off in T-38s, and then I flew C-141s, and then when I went to a test pilot school, and then I flew C-17s for flight test. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we got one more question we're being told. I think one is, I think we, I think just having like the Virgin name, I think we draw like that, like we, we sort of have that draw to the people we're looking for that are one, very technically competent. And I would say there's a great market out there because we had, you know, we had a lot of engineering jobs open up and there are some really talent, talented people, very educated out there. But we're also looking for those that can deal with the team, deal with adversity, deal with it well. Um, so I think just being the Virgin brand, that helps us a lot, get in the right type of person. And honestly, it's usually kind of hard to select because there's so many qualified candidates. Yeah, I went through the hiring process for my role and Kelly decided that I, she gave me the <laughs> thumbs up for it. Uh, but often, yeah, it, it's, it's kind of interesting to communicate, you know, what the job entails and you just really have to be upfront with people when you're going through the hiring process. And um, it's, it's I'm guessing it's pretty similar to other, you know, situations where there are people doing this operation that has inherent risk to it. Uh, so it's, it's really making sure that you're not, you know, you're getting someone who is coming into it and you can really rely on them in the face of pressure, which again, you know, you start off slow at the start and along the way you kind of have to do a lot of checking in to make sure that, hey, you're still good. Uh, and if there's any, you know, reason to believe that someone's not ready to do something they're not ready for, that's again where the culture comes into play and we have to make sure that we're going to assess that sort of thing. So we definitely do have uh, difficulty maintaining, you know, the right number of people plus the right number of backups in case, uh, in case somebody gets sick or can't fly or whatever. Um, so it's a challenge that we face for sure. Just one more. Yes, it's currently, yeah, there's currently, I mean, there's, I would say there's no definite plans, but the plan is to get another launch vehicle and stuff. And what's interesting is, is I mean, it would be great to get a freighter, right, because then we could actually ship our own rocket with us and stuff, but the upper decks are different, and right now, freighters are in huge demand, so it's actually difficult to find one. All right. After. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Yeah.